I'm going over Edgeworth boxes in this video, and in this world we have two people. We have Meg and Tom, and we have two goods. That's bars of chocolate, and there's 12 bars of chocolate in this world, and bananas, and we have eight bananas in this world. So the first thing we need to understand is the space we're working with. And I have two points on this space. And the thing about each point on this space is it has two perspectives. One is Meg's perspective, and the other is Tom's perspective. So from Meg's perspective, point A gives her three bars of chocolate and one banana. So for Meg, that point is three ones. For Tom, however, um, she gets three bars of chocolate, and he gets the remaining nine bars of chocolate. So for him, that point represents him getting nine bars of chocolate, and he gets uh, seven of the eight bananas. So for him, that point is nine, seven. And let's do another example. Point B represents Meg getting eight bars of chocolate, meaning Tom gets the remaining four bars of chocolate that there are. And Meg, at this point B, gets five bananas, to, so Tom gets the remaining three bananas. So for this point, which is eight, five, for Meg, it's going to be four, three for Tom. Um, so that's how we understand the space. Um, how do we understand indifference curves in this map? Well, for Meg, indifference curves are just pretty normal. Meg is sitting here on this axis like we're used to, so her indifference curves just look like normal and concave indifference curves. So Meg's indifference cur curve through point A might look something like this. And then Meg's indifference curve through B might look something like that. For Tom, however, we actually have to flip the diagram upside down to think about what that'll look like for Tom. So I created, oh, hold on. I created an Edgeworth box that we can actually flip over since I can't flip the whiteboard over. So here is an, an Edgeworth box with Meg down here and Tom up there, kind of like we've got on our map now. And we flip this upside down. And when we do that, Tom is now at the bottom. And um, and with Tom at the bottom, we can draw some indifference curves. So if Tom's down here, his indifference curves now look normal. His indifference curves look like this. And Meg's indifference curves look weird. Hers, hers, hers look concave, concave from this perspective. So here's a couple of indifference curves for Tom. There's three indifference curves for Tom. And we still have the two indifference curves from Meg. So Tom's indifference curves look normal if he were down here. We just flipped that diagram upside down. So I can draw those on here, even though I can't flip this upside down. So Tom's indifference curve through B might look something like this, which you can see has an indifference curve shape from Tom's perspective. And his indifference curve through A might look something like that. Um, so now we have indifference curves on this map, map from the two people's perspectives. So now how do we think about Pareto optimality? Well, let's start by asking ourselves, is point A a Pareto optimal point? Um, and in this case, what this really means is could Meg and Tom make some mutually beneficial trade between uh, bananas and chocolate? that would benefit both of them. And if that's true, then this is not a Pareto optimal point. And I actually know this isn't a Pareto optimal point because I can find another point right here, point C, that is better for both Meg. It's on a higher indifference curve for Meg, and it's also on a higher indifference curve for Tom. We know Meg's indifference curves get better as we go in that direction, and Tom's indifference curves get better as we come in this direction because this means Tom is getting more. So point C is better for both than point A, so A is definitely not Pareto optimal. Um, the question is, is C Pareto optimal? And we can find that out by drawing both people's indifference curves through C. Um, and we see, um, is there a way to make both people better off? And there is. In fact, all of this space in here will be better for both people than point C. So you can find some Pareto optimal point in the middle here, and that's going to be a point where the two people's indifference curves are tangent to one another. And that got a little bit messy, so let me let me do it over here in a way that is less messy. 
So over here we have this point, we'll call it point D, that is Pareto optimal. And we've already noticed there's one, there's at least two Pareto optimal points on this map. Um, so how many points in total on this map might be Pareto optimal? How many points could you find? Oh boy, that's a mess. Oh well, that's okay. You see the, the unmessy piece up there. Um, so the question was, how many points on the map have tangent and difference curves for Tom and Meg? And the answer is that there's an infinite number of points, and you can actually map, and let me use a different color for this. You can actually map um, a line from one side to another. It doesn't have to be a straight line. It can be curvy and things like that. That is entirely made up of um, Pareto optimal points. So that means every single point on this line has Meg's indifference curve and Tom's indifference curve as tangent. And that's called the contract curve. So let me label the contract curve. Contract curve. And we know that if the point is not on the contract curve, the two people can trade to make them both better off. So the contract curve is the set of all points that are Pareto optimal. And that's how you think about Edgeworth boxes. 